I've been making engineering videos for over eight years, and I've been an engineer for even longer than that. In fact, I've been making things my entire life. When I was a kid, I remember using my dad's welder to build a giant trebuchet to launch watermelons across my backyard. You know, regular kid stuff. And it amazes me that even today as I build projects, I'm still learning new and better ways to do something. In fact, every time this happens, I think to myself, man, I wish I'd known this sooner. So here are eight things I wish I had known sooner, including something about calipers that you might not know. As I started compiling this list, it got longer and longer, and a lot of the things ended up being like pieces of wisdom, things that you kind of have to experience. Like, for example, you gotta fail quickly. When you're building something, don't spend a bunch of time only to figure out it doesn't work. Try to figure out the quickest way to fail quickly, those kind of things. But for this list, I wanted to keep it really practical. So the first thing I wish I had known sooner was to use a logic analyzer. A logic analyzer is a device that you connect up to your computer and it can help you visualize when two things are communicating to each other. So for example, I've got an Arduino nano board here and I've got a temperature thermocouple. It's actually the same thermocouple that I used in the solder reflow oven that I built a couple years ago. So the Arduino board is sending information over to the thermocouple and the thermocouple is responding. It's actually using the SPI protocol, the serial peripheral interface and so there's data flowing in both directions when I was getting started the spy protocol was a little bit of a mystery to me and it was a little bit hard to understand but eventually I ended up getting a logic analyzer and I could visualize these signals flipping from one to zero and it made so much more sense and it actually saved me a whole bunch of time when I was troubleshooting several projects because I could visualize the timing of things and make sure everything was working the way it was supposed to label everything seriously Label everything. If you want to stay organized and you want to know where everything is, everything needs to have a home and have a label on it. The next item is a tool, and it's over here at the 3D printer. I make a lot of things on the 3D printer, and that means removing a lot of support material. So when I print with brims, sometimes it's a little bit hard to get those brims to come off cleanly. But then I learned about using a deburring tool. This is usually used in like a machine shop for machining metal and aluminum and stuff like that, where you can take off uh, and deburr sharp edges. Well, it works really well for 3D prints as well. So for example, if I look here, this brim didn't come off super clean, so I can use the deburring tool here and just scrape it along the edge like that, and it really cleans up 3D prints really nice. This saves me a lot of time and frustration and makes my prints look a lot better. Sometimes I just use it to even clean or soften edges on things. Oh, and there's one more thing that I wanna point out while I'm here at the 3D printer, and that's using these countersink deburring tools. Anytime I design a part that has a hole or like a cylindrical face in it, I will use the countersink deburring tool and I'll run that in there and it puts a perfect chamfer around that. This comes in handy if I'm trying to slide this piece onto like a metal rod or something like that, or if you're gonna tap the hole with threads, having that chamfer makes it so much easier to start the tap. Next up, we've got calipers. I use these a lot as I'm 3D modeling and most of us know how to do the basic measurements with calipers, but there's actually four ways you can use calipers to measure things. The calipers have a fixed jaw here and they have a sliding jaw. And you can use the fixed jaw and sliding jaw together to measure the outside diameter of something like this. You can also use the fixed jaw and the sliding jaw to measure an inside diameter like this. And then of course you've got the depth gauge. That's a skinny piece that slides out the bottom and that's really handy if you've got a small hole to measure. The depth gauge is great for measuring dimensions that are very narrow, but I wish somebody had told me about this fourth way, and that's the back here. If you look at the back of your calipers, your fixed jaw and your sliding jaw make a little bit of a step here, and that's really what you should be using to measure a step or a shoulder on a part. So let me show you here on the stepper motor. If I use the depth gauge to measure the depth of the shaft, that small face kind of gives me too much wobble. But if I used the fixed jaw and I press that up against there, it's a lot more rigid and a lot more accurate. Before I learned this tip, I would use the depth gauge to make these kind of measurements, and it seemed like all of my measurements were always off by a little bit, but now that I've switched over to this, my 3D models are a lot more accurate, and all my parts that I make are way more precise. 
And for the next one, I'm over here at my workbench where I do a lot of gluing. And I learned at one point that isopropyl alcohol will remove hot glue. I think hot glue is kind of an underrated adhesive because most people think of it as like a chintzy craft item, but I use it all the time for a temporary adhesive that I know I can remove. So I've got two pieces of 3D printed material here that I've been hot glued together and they're pretty rigid, but I can remove that hot glue by simply getting some isopropyl alcohol and I kind of soak that glue joint. And the goal is to get the alcohol to seep between the joint of the surface and the glue. And once it does that, that hot glue will just break right off. Look how easy that came off. It was like pulling brisket off of a bone. There's no evidence at all that I had hot glue on these items. So here on my workbench, I've got several puddles of hot glue. You know when you plug in a hot glue gun, it kind of drools all over the place. It's inevitable. Obviously I exaggerated it a little bit here, but I'm gonna use isopropyl alcohol and I'm just gonna soak those glue spots and try to get it underneath. Like once you get it started underneath and it seeps in there, that's really when you can get it to just kind of pull off. If you have some glue that's extra stubborn, I recommend using a plastic razor blade like this to kind of get it started. Then you can soak the alcohol underneath it and it should pop right off. I don't know if you've tried to pick and pull at hot glue, but sometimes it's a disaster. It breaks apart into a million little pieces and you can never get all of it. This prevents all of that frustration and it just comes off all in one piece. I will typically buy 90% isopropyl alcohol and instead of keeping it in its original container, I'll put it in these little squeeze bottles that have lure lock tips on it. That makes it so much easier to get it into tight spaces. This next item makes the list because I think it's underrated. I call it corrugated tube, but you can also call it convoluted tube, wire loom, or protective hose. No matter what you call this material, its job is to keep your wires protected and tidy. I've got some wires here that I wanna put into a project. So I'm gonna cut off a length of the corrugated tube. For short runs like this, I'm just gonna stuff the wire through. But if you had a long run, if you look closely at the tube, it's got a slit all the way down the length so you can actually just kind of shove it in with your fingers. This protective hose is often used like in the engine compartment of vehicles because it's heat resistant and it can withstand those rugged environments. Now that I got this in, I wanna make sure that these wires don't slip around. So I'm gonna use cable ties to secure them in place. And then to tighten the cable ties, this is totally unnecessary, but I have this really cool ratchet gun that tightens and cuts cable ties. Watch this. It's so satisfying. I love using this thing. So this is what it looks like after you've installed the corrugated tube and it's all cinched down with cable ties. I used this material a lot in this project. These are my life-size Rock'em Sock'em robots. I connected them up to an air compressor. They have all sorts of electronics in them and my friend and I had a boxing match. Each robot has an IMU in its chest that runs down to the central microcontroller. Also, the eyes have bar LEDs that keep track of the score. So there are a ton of wires running from each of these robots down to the central microcontroller. And having the corrugated tube tidied everything up, it prevented snags and it made it a lot easier to keep track of which wires needed to go where. So this is a material that if I had known about sooner, I would have been using a lot more. Right guys? Uh, affirmative. This next one is a quick one, but it's something that I use all the time when making repairs. We all use CA glue, like super glue, when we're repairing objects. We wanna make a quick and permanent bond, we use CA glue. But what you might not know is that you can add baking soda to CA glue as a hardener. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here is a spool holder I printed, but as soon as I pulled it off the build plate, I realized this bolt shaft was too long, so I cut it shorter and I glued it back on. But I'm not entirely confident that this joint is going to be as strong as I need it, so I'm gonna add some baking soda and add some strength to this joint. So I've got some baking soda here on, so I'm just gonna add a little, oh gosh, <laughs> it's not me. So I'm gonna carefully add some baking soda right in that joint. It's almost like I'm making a fillet on that edge. And I like to use thin CA glue so that it seeps in. So if you find yourself in the same situation and you wanna strengthen a super glue joint, use baking soda. And finally, here's the last thing I wish I had known sooner. It's actually several things and they all have to do with soldering. Honestly, I could make an entire video about soldering tips. So here are a few of my favorites. And the first thing is the surface that I use when using a hot air gun. 
I went to the hardware store and I picked up a ceramic tile for a couple of dollars. And this does an excellent job of protecting my work surface from burn marks. Before I had this, I was always worried about adding too much heat and making burn marks on my workbench, but the ceramic does a really good job of absorbing and dissipating that heat. What's even better are these silicon mats that I got recently. What I like about the soldering mats is that they do the same thing. They protect my workbench and give me a safe surface to work on. Next up is Flux. When I got started, I only knew about Flux pens. And I don't know if it was user error or something I was doing wrong, but I always had a really hard time getting these to work properly. And that is until I discovered that Flux comes in different types. I've got this Flux gel that has a lure lock syringe on it and that lets me get into really tight spaces and I had way more success switching to this type. There are way more types of flux than what I've shown here. Just look how many I found on the DigiKey website. So if you're struggling with using flux pens, make sure you do some research and find a different type that might work better for you. Next up, we've got these. I always have a running joke that engineers should have evolved to have three arms because every time I'm working, it seems like I always need another hand, and that's why they make these tools. This is called a third hand or a helping hand, and this one is called a Panavice Junior. They're different styles, and there are definitely more options than these, but these are the ones I have on hand. And the idea is that they help you hold things in place. I like using the helping hands when I'm using wire or different parts that I need to solder to, and I use the Panavice when I'm working with a circuit board or some sort of breakout board because it has slots in there that hold a circuit board and that makes it so much easier to work on these things. I can't wait for Evolution to give me a third arm so in the meantime I gotta use these. The next thing I want to talk about is solder sponges. When I first got started I was using the wet sponge type like this. I would get it wet and anytime I needed to clean the tip of my soldering iron I would wipe it on there but the reason this is bad is that water is not good for the tip of your soldering iron. It can cause corrosion and it also can cause thermal shock when you're getting it from hot to cold so quickly. So the better alternative is using the brass sponges. They are dry, there's no water involved, and there's no thermal shock. So this is a much better way to keep your soldering iron tips clean. There you have it, eight things that I wish I'd known sooner, plus a few extra bonus ones. If you wanna see me use some of those soldering tips in action, go check out the video where I built an MPPT charge controller. That's it for this video. My name is Zach, and I'm the Bite Size Engineer.